The Unshackled Waves, Episode 90. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. I'm back in Australia now. It was a great experience to be in New Zealand. Got to interview some high profile people and of course collaborate with our friends at Right Minds New Zealand. Now that I'm back, we are working on some further expansion plans for the Unshackled, so stay tuned for those in the next few months. Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts will join me in a moment to discuss the week's events. But first I will tell you what is happening in the world right now. The same-sex marriage plebiscite debate hit some new extremes over the past week. Tony Abbott was headbutted by a self-described anarchist DJ, uh, Astro Loeb, who was wearing a Vote Yes uh, badge. Then over the weekend, Australians received a Vote Yes text message, and we saw Yes campaigners door knock around Australia. Then there was also a protest at the Coalition for Marriage Melbourne launch, which featured a banner which said, uh, Burn Churches, Not Queers. However, there was some vandalism of properties featuring Yes campaign material. Some have said that this was probably a false flag, but who really knows? And now there is a debate whether it's appropriate for white US rapper Macklemore to sing his song Same Love at the NRL Grand Final, given we are in the middle of this plebiscite, and also because it is a political statement at a sporting event. Malcolm Turnbull celebrated a win of some sorts this week, using the strong arm of government to force gas suppliers to keep more gas available for domestic uh, market uh, under the threat of introducing export controls. This follows his previous meetings with energy retailers to convince them to find ways to reduce electricity prices. It's quite concerning that the Turnbull government's approach to energy policy appears to be further interventions in the market rather than exploring free market solutions or reducing red and green tape. There was finally some good economic news to come from the federal government. The budget deficit for the uh, 2016-17 financial year will now be $33.2 billion, down from $37.6 billion projected in the May budget. Uh, these were due to lower spending in social services, employment services, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and most notably border control. A budget surplus is still not projected until 2020-2021, but it is still promising that the coalition is doing the best it can, working with within the current legislative framework to reduce spending. The eligibility of seven federal MPs who hold dual citizenship uh, to sit in the federal parliament is finally being decided by the High Court. Uh, They have ruled that One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts was a British citizen at the time of his nomination, uh, but they have not yet decided on his eligibility yet. The federal government is defending five out of the seven MPs, claiming they had uh, citizenship bestowed on them without their knowledge. It remains to be seen how strictly this High Court will interpret Section 44. Uh, Germany had their federal election on Sunday, and while it looks like uh, Angela Merkel will remain Chancellor, she will have to put together an unlikely coalition of the Free Democrats and the Greens. This is because she does not want to work with the New Nationalist Party in the Parliament, uh, Alternative for Germany, or AFD as they are known. Uh, They have surged in popularity in the wake of Merkel's decision to let over a million uh, refugees into the country, uh, which has been the main pull factor in the continuing European migrant crisis. Ride-sharing service Uber has had its operating license revoked in London due to a lack of compliance. It's prompted the taxi industry and transport workers union in Australia to call for a review into Uber here. Although Uber has done a lot for competition in the transport industry, uh, even its biggest fans cannot deny it has severe cultural problems, which led to its CEO resigning earlier this year. The latest developments in the tensions between North Korea and the Trump administration is that North Korea has stated they now view an attack on the United States as inevitable and have blamed Donald Trump's rhetoric and have declared that they will shoot down uh, US aircraft within the vicinity of its airspace and have also bolstered its defense presence around its nation. The biggest story to come out of the United States Uh, regards the National Football League, uh, its players kneeling before the National Anthem, uh, which is played before games, to protest the treatment of African Americans by police. It was started last year by player Colin Kaepernick, 
and it has happened again at the beginning of the 2017 NFL season. Trump said that the NFL players uh, should be fired by the owners if they're uh, uh, kneeling before the anthem, and also that fans should walk walk out. And this has meant that even more players have participated in the kneeling. Uh, Nobody is denying the NFL players have free speech, but using their workplace and the national anthem to make a political point uh, seems to be an inappropriate place. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. Yeah, um, thanks, Tim. It's uh, great to be back, and uh, welcome back to Australia. Yeah, it's definitely good to be back, but boy, is there a lot of work to to catch up on, so I've been flat out the last few days. Yeah, well, there's there's a lot of uh, leftist hysteria to talk about. There's... uh, there's a lot to talk about uh, in this week's show as well. Yeah, and obviously if we've or we tried to go a week without uh, talking about it, but it's just in the news all the time. The uh, same-sex marriage plebiscite debate, there's been more uh, controversies. Uh, once we were finished recording last week's show, there was more news. Uh, Tony Abbott was uh, headbutted by a man wearing a Yes badge in uh, Hobart. And then on the weekend at the uh, uh, Coalition for Marriage uh, launch, we saw a banner unfurled which uh, said, uh, burn churches, not queers. And then, of course, we had the mass spam uh, vote yes text messages and uh, door knocking from the yes campaign. And so it, it wasn't a very good week for, for the yes campaign. And uh, even though they are still ahead in the, the polls, it seems that they're doing everything they can to you know, alienate people from voting yes. Well, that's, that's very true. And in the Australian, uh, we've seen the, the support... Um, go down go down from 63 to 57 percent and the no support rise from 30 to 34 so we just 30 to 34 you know 34 to 57 you know still sounds like a marketable gap but in the scheme of things it, it isn't really because there's a lot of people who are uncommitted as well so I think that um, like Hillary Clinton lost the unlosable election to Donald Trump I think there is a small, small possibility that the yes campaign could lose an unlosable campaign to the no side. But at the beginning of this week, we also saw um, some alleged uh, violence on the no side. We saw uh, a number of properties vandalised in Brisbane that had uh, rainbow uh, flags out the front. One uh, had... uh, on the rainbow flag swastikas uh, drawn on it, which is, I mean, that's appalling. Uh, there have been some on the no side who've, uh, who've claimed that maybe this is a false flag by the, the, the yes campaign to you know, ma- make the no side look bad given the, the bad week the yes campaign had last week. And, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't rule that out completely, but I do find it, you know, hard to believe that, you know, there, there would be this, you know, mass uh, people from the yes campaign would engage in this mass vandalism of their, their own property. Well, you know, I think it is quite possible, uh, knowing the radicalism that exists within these uh, Marxist fringes. We we saw the banner um, unveiled in a in a no vote talk. You know, burn churches, not queers. And I definitely do think that the radicalism exists to uh, fabricate uh, such an incident. Uh, but without the empirical evidence, you obviously can't make a you know, a completely um, valid, you know, argument for that case. But it certainly wouldn't surprise me, uh, knowing the, the extremism on the on the yes side. But one also has to remember that there are vile elements on both sides, on both extremes of, of uh, both the yes and the no vote, as both Tanya Plibersek and... Uh, Attorney General George Brandis uh, said this week that there's extremists on both sides, but but certainly it wouldn't surprise me if the radical left Marxists of the yes vote uh, were fabricating the, the that incident of having the swastika on a rainbow flag in front of a house. It certainly wouldn't come as any surprise to me. Yeah. 
And like I said, I don't want to come out right away and accuse these, you know, yes campaigners of being liars. But there, there is also that possibility. We just have to, you know, see because there is a police investigation of it. See, see what they come up with. Well, I think that you know, with say Barack Obama and the uh, hands up, don't shoot. He made a, a gut call and he made it early and it was the wrong call. So I think that we also have to make sure that we don't make a gut call that's wrong and that we wait for the facts to come out and we should wait for the police invested investigation to be conducted and to see what results that yields. But I certainly wouldn't be surprised if it was some form of fabrication. And we also saw later this week uh, Frances Abbott, Tony Abbott's youngest uh, daughter, joining the, the Yes campaign. She'd already stated she was voting Yes, but she appeared in a marriage equality uh, advertisement, which is obviously the, the Yes campaign were eager to promote this since uh, Tony Abbott is seen as the, the face of the, the No campaign. And it was... Uh, it was quite a good, you know, video, but it's also, I think, you know, quite cynical. Like, they wouldn't do a video with her if she wasn't Tony Abbott's daughter. Well, well I actually don't know how effective that would have could have been because Gough Whitlam and um, uh, Malcolm Fraser uh, got together and did an ad for the re Republican um, campaign uh, in 1999. And obviously the Republican side, led by Malcolm Turnbull in that instance, thought it was a very clever idea. But maybe, and that backfired on them, but maybe this getting Francis Abbott to do an ad for the Yes campaign, you know, could be seen in a different light, you know. Um, could be seen as a bit vindictive or a bit nasty or, or, or just... Or it could be seen as very clever politics, you know. I, I couldn't be the one to judge that on how the public receives such an ad, but I certainly do think that it does have the the, the kind of the prob probability to backfire, you know, if they're seeing that as sheer opportunism uh, from the yes side. Yeah, like I, like I said, that it, it does, you know, it does look like the yes campaign is taking a swipe at Tony Abbott, like, haha, you know, not even your daughter agree, agrees with her, with you. Yeah, and, and still, I'm not sure how the public will perceive that, but I think it, it is, A, either very, very clever politics uh, in that ad, or, B, it will be seen as vindictive and nasty. So I, I'm not one to, to be able to fully judge how the public will receive that. But obviously, um, it appears to me from the, from the outset there that, uh, that it is very clever uh, from, the, from the yes side. And of course, there's been another controversy with uh, white rapper Macklemore. Uh, he's going to be the uh, entertainment at the NRL Grand Final in Sydney this weekend. And one of the songs he's uh, performing is uh, "Same Love," which is a you know pro uh, same-sex uh, marriage anthem. Now, it is a you know no, it was a number one hit in Australia, so nobody can dispute that it's a popular song, but. Of course, the the timing, considering that we are in the the middle of a you know, plebiscite campaign, and you know, there's there's already been a lot of backlash to sporting organisations getting involved in politics. Uh, you know, the the timing of this just seems you know inappropriate. Who, who is this guy, Malcolm Moore? Who is he? I haven't heard of him. He's uh, must have fallen off the face of the earth. He seems a real. Seems a real nobody gets caught up in kind of so, social justice who are yeah, but uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think you can't dispute that it was a it was a smash hit when it came out. You know, he he's passed it. You know, he just he caters to this kind of far left fringe social justice warrior kind of millennial. You know, he sings songs about white guilt and same sex marriage, and he's you know he's um, he's awfully political, but. I think the interesting thing was Tony Abbott uh, sharing uh, a petition uh, to to ban uh, Malcolm Moore singing uh, this song at the NRL Grand Final, and 
it was interesting to see how George Brandis pointed out this hypocrisy when um, when he said that Tony Abbott um, is supposedly a big proponent of free speech and he's um, calling for this song to be banned at an NRL grand final purely because he doesn't like it. But I also think that that argument that Attorney General Brandis points out is a double-edged sword because free speech also means that Tony Abbott, you know, has the ability to, to call for a boycott of, of this, this event as well. So I think that um, Brandis has to realise that the, the good, the bad and the ugly does come with free speech. Oh, well, it'll be interesting to note what reception the the song gets when it when he when it's sung at the NRL Grand Final, and you know if the fans you know like it, then I guess the NRL made the the right decision. But if there's you know booing, then I think the the NRL you know might reconsider. Yeah, for sure. But I do think of the average NRL uh, viewer or person who comes to the ground as someone who picks up the Daily Telegraph. You know, who's a trader, who's not overly political. Um, and and I, I certainly don't think that they would appreciate the politicisation of the NRL grand final for same-sex marriage. There was more news on the energy crisis front this week. Uh, Turnbull uh, had a, another or oh, another meeting, or I shouldn't say meeting, with gas companies, but he more threatened these gas companies uh, with export controls if they didn't keep more gas for uh, domestic use. And it's the high uh, gas prices, electricity prices. Uh, have been partly blamed on too much gas being uh, exported. And it also builds on Turnbull's meeting with the, the energy companies uh, 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 earlier this month, uh, talking about ways to reduce uh, energy bills. And, and it seems to be that the way that we're solving this energy crisis is for Turnbull to basically use uh, the force of government, strong arm tactics to say, you know, you private companies, you know, you better, you know, bring down your prices, do this and th that. Uh, otherwise, you know, I'm going to, you know, introduce laws to control your behaviour. Yeah, I think it is inherently anti-free market. Um, and Turnbull is looking for a Band-Aid solution on this issue. He's not looking uh, to say, hey, where does the gas shortage come from? Uh, is it these, you know, greedy monolithic corporations, you know, exporting all the gas and leaving pensioners cold in winter? Or is it the fact that a lot of state governments are uh, Labor state governments are influenced, heavily influenced by the, the, the green left um, who says that conventional gas exploration or even coal seam fracking uh, isn't very good. But I, I also think that that whole fracking argument is, is a complete misnomer in Victoria because brown coal in itself is terrible for fracking. It doesn't actually have much gas in it. So banning fracking within Victoria uh, is just uh, a sign of virtue signalling. Uh, really, the only potential for fracking is in Queensland, where there's a lot of black coal. But, but certainly, if if Turnbull is to, to, to strong arm, I'd want him to strong arm the states. Say to the states that, you know, we will cut your GST uh, redistribution in half. Uh, if you are going to keep your pensions cold in winter, if you're going to kill your manufacturing and your small business by these, you know, terribly expensive, you know, gas and energy prices that are simply created by a lack of supply. Uh, but of course, uh, politically, it's much easier to attack, you know, evil, you know, corporations, you know, ripping off the consumer than actually, you know, take on uh, uh, a state government because uh, we saw uh, earlier this year Josh Frydenberg try to, uh, you know, take on uh, Jay, uh, Jay Weatherall, the South Australian Premier, over, over his government's handling of energy policy and it, you know, just... Uh, you know, was a back and forth between them and just looked politically, you know, messy. And so, you know, they're obviously trying to go for the, the small target here and obviously corporations are the easiest one. Yeah, and, and obviously um, it, it is politically expedient for Turnbull to, um, to, to target 
big business, you know, um, it, it's, it looks better. Um, but certainly we should uh, be looking at, you know, free market solutions of uh, lowering restrictions and regulations upon on upon gas companies, upon upon coal companies, so we can actually have cheap, affordable electricity. Because economically speaking, we can't have world's highest power prices and also have the world's highest wages and uh, expect to be competitive in a in a globalized economy. That's ludicrous. For us to be competitive and to have high wages and to have a high standard of living within Australia. We need to have lower energy prices. It's quite simple. And the uh, uh, the gas companies have said, uh, as you mentioned, that part of the reason why uh, gas prices are so high is because of all the bans on you know gas uh, exploration. Um, but of course, this isn't. Uh, well, I mean, it's mentioned by members of the Turnbull government, but it's they're they're not they're not really, as we mentioned, taking up the the fight to these state governments because of uh, political reasons. But yes, it's you you have to also look at the the fact about why all this gas is, as the expression would go, siphoned off overseas. Obviously, uh, the the gas companies think that you know the, they can make a a better profit by selling the gas overseas rather than to the domestic market. And you have to ask, you know, why is that the case? Yeah, that, that is a very good question, and, and one could assume that that is the case because of the incredible amounts of uh, corporate taxation that occur. Um, you know, we, we have a, a corporate tax rate on big business that is one of the highest in the world, um, and for gas companies to actually make profit within the domestic market, uh, it isn't very uh, easy for them to do when they're, you know, they're at least spending a third of uh, every dollar that they earn back onto taxation. So I think the root cause of most economic problems is government intervention within the economy. Uh, leave business to do business and leave government uh, to, to govern the country. And I think then we'll be in a better shape. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting that this problem, the energy crisis, is being caused by you know government and intervention. Obviously, with you know renewable energy target, the restrictions on uh, energy uh, exploration, and uh, and not to mention all of the other you know, regulations that are, that our government puts on. And the solution seems to be more gov government inter intervention by Turnbull, basically threatening these companies. Well, we need to look at when we had cheap electricity prices, and this was in the days of, you know, Howard Costello, when we had a completely, pretty much a completely deregulated uh, electricity market, especially Kennett, completely deregulated. There wasn't so much pressure on the coal companies. They weren't thought of as these evil big companies. Uh, it, and we had cheaper power prices because there was, you know, less taxation, less regulation upon them. Um, but I, the f thing I find rather funny, or should I say quite tragic, is the fact that uh, Labor doesn't appeal to their kind of redneck, blue-collar worker anymore. They, they're appealing to the inner city trendy. They're leaving the timber mill worker, the logger, the coal miner behind for the, the middle class you know, inner city um, intellectual, the, the left-wing intelligentsia over the, uh, the, the working class. Uh, you can see that certainly Labor everywhere. 2004 election, Latham, you know, essentially wanted to lock up the, the logging industry within Tasmania. Uh, and then you see uh, Daniel Andrews here giving the timber mill workers a hard time. Uh, then you see Dan Andrews here, you know, giving the coal companies a hard time. So certainly the Labor Party has left its base and it's more, uh, sees it more politically expedient to virtue signal to the inner city intelligentsia rather than protect the working class. And I find this quite um, a shocking and bewildering fact. Yeah, uh, you, you definitely can't rely on the uh, Labor Party to you know, try and solve this crisis. I mean, you know, they're, they're much more, 
uh, comfortable, you know, doing all these photo ops in front of wind farms or or, or solar panels. It's funny you mention uh, Latham there. Obviously, he's changed a lot since his 2004 election. The solution that he proposed this week was, uh, you know, we should have more nuclear energy given that we have one of the world's highest uh, uranium deposits. Uh, but, of course, that is another area which it's too politically sensitive to, to go into because, once again, you know, the Greens and the environmentalists will say, you know, we'll have, you know, uh, nuclear meltdowns uh, and they'll bring up, you know, Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. Yeah, well, you can't win because I had a conversation with someone over a coffee once uh, and I said, oh, they said to me, oh, coal's bad. Okay, so what about gas? Gas is bad. Oh, nuclear is bad. And uh, we can only go forward with wind and solar. And I said to them, you, you need a base load. And, um, yeah, and they said, oh, yeah, you need a base load. And I said, do you know how much, you know, carbon and uh, carbon uh, dioxide and how much waste occurs actually making these Tesla batteries? So, essentially, you can't win. Um, they, some of these greenies would prefer us to be uh, getting around town with a cart and a mule uh, and they'd want us to be going back to the Victorian Victorian times rather than actually, uh, you know, focusing on humans. The Greens seem to be inherently anti-human. They seem to be focused on the environment. Uh, the, obviously, the environment matters and whales um, uh, rather than, you know, the the pensioner, uh, which, which is really concerning. Of course, and they, you know, the Greens view humans as an inherent evil force on the planet. Um, and, and if humans weren't here, then animals would be peaceful and the environment would be perfect. But they, they neglect to mention facts like dolphins eat their own babies, fish eat their own babies. You know, the animal kingdom is vicious and it is actually in ha probably more evil and more violent than humans. But the, the Greens live in this alternative reality that, you know, ignores facts, uh, that says that, you know, keeping um, 500 people out of work at Hazelwood and keeping thousands of pensioners cold, you know, is better than having 0 0.005 degrees of warming. So they're just in La La Land, and I think that we need a state government here in Victoria that is happy to stand up to these green greeny thugs, really. <laughs> There was finally some good economic news this week. Uh, Treasurer Scott Morrison announced that the uh, budget deficit for the 2016-17 financial year was $33.2 billion, which was down from the $37.6 billion uh, projected in the May budget. Uh, he also outlined the areas where money had been saved, uh, social services, employment services, the uh, National uh, Disability Insurance Scheme, and also what I found the, the most interesting was that uh, border control uh, costs were down thanks to uh, the, the boats being stopped. Yeah, I think that that is good. One, one problem I do have is with this is that they said that we were saving money uh, because of the slow uptake on the NDIS, which I find a bit problematic, if we do have people who have uh, disabilities um, who aren't, you know, getting the the care that they deserve, um, that is a bit problematic. You know, we we can say that you know welfare is inherently evil, but I think that welfare should be there for people who can't help themselves, and not for people who don't want to work and who want to you know, have a right of the the taxpayers' dollar. But certainly, I do think that that uh, tightening up on our on our generous social security is necessary in the long term to balance the budget. But we also have to look at other things within the budget that cost us a lot of money. For instance, Medicare. Uh, that that is a huge part of our budget, um, and would you know privatising more elements of Medicare, uh, improve care and improve efficiency and and costs in the long term. They're certainly things that we uh, should be looking at as well. Uh, there's certainly more substantial uh, budget cuts that the government can make, but of course. 
uh, ever since the the coalition government came to power in 2013, uh, they've been uh, you know restricted by by the Senate, uh, knocking back a lot of their budget rep repair measures. And so this was, uh, I think, a good achievement that they were able to achieve this reduction in the deficit uh, without uh, appropriation uh, bills. Because remember, we've got the the big government block in the Senate, you know, Nick Xenophon, uh, Jackie Lambie, uh, and so they've, they've, they've done the best that they could given the, uh, res the situation that they're in. Certainly, I think that one problem that the government does have is that a lot of senators haven't picked up a book like this, you know, The Road to Serfdom, like this. Milton Friedman, free to choose. They don't understand basic economics. You know, they don't understand that we are on the road to serfdom through, you know, basically being, you know, owned by, you know, the big central banks or the government, you know, constantly higher taxation, you know, working for the government, working to pay off the debt and deficit. Um, I certainly don't think that they, you know, understand that those, those principles exist. But... Yeah, certainly there are plenty of places to be places that we can cut in the budget. Um, some places that I don't think we should touch are certainly uh, defence. Uh, I think that a strong defence is is vital to peace in the Asia Pacific region, and I certainly do think that there are plenty of peacekeeping missions that the ADF can be doing. Um, but yeah, I think that there are still plenty of areas to cut. And I think that most of most of these are, you know, wasteful and use, useless government programs, federal government programs that we can cut. Um, and there, there are certainly many uh, government services that we can still privatise. Uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head at the moment, but certainly uh, one uh, instance of where privatisation of the government services work well uh, would be employment uh, services, the how of government uh, did that, and um, the uh, private companies were offered remuneration uh, depended on how many people they got into a job. And certainly, a bureaucrat in an office in Canberra, Melbourne, or Sydney, you know, wouldn't have that free market incentive to get people into a job. So, certainly, I do think that there is room for further privatisation and, uh, you know, more fiscal constraint because we do have to realise that there is. $20,000 worth of debt on top of every living Australian, and uh, that is ridiculous. Of course, it hasn't got to the level of, of France or, or of uh, England where they have $50,000 US on top of every citizen's head, but certainly we, we need to get our house in order before, you know, it is a realm of chaos. Yeah, the budget situation in Australia, it's still not great. I mean, a surplus of uh, $7.4 billion is still not projected until 2020-21. And remember, we were supposed to be back in surplus uh, by 2012-13 uh, where of under the, the Gillard government. I mean, that was the projection uh, back then. And let's, let's not forget, we've still got the debt, which is at, around about at 480 uh, billion now. So we're, we're still not in a, in a good situation, but you know, at least finally there was some good news because we're so used to the governments of both sides saying the budget situation is, you know, worse than we anticipated, you know, revenues are, are down, you know, we're not going to be able to have a surplus for, for this X, X amount of years. Well, certainly, I, I do think that closing tax loopholes uh, would be a good way to um, get us back in surplus. Um, you know, closing up deductions uh, and having a flat tax uh, for every citizen who earns, you know, above $45,000 of $20,000, you know, a similar model to what the, the LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, proposes um, would be good. Uh, because one of the reasons why I think that we are in, in such an inordinate amount of debt is because our taxation rates are so high, so the corporations look to, um, you know, go through as many loopholes or deductions or, you know, house their taxations uh, overseas, much like Apple does in Ireland where they've got a, a taxation rate of 12.5% over in America where they've got one of 35%, so they move to Ireland. So I think that for Australia to 
uh, get back in, in surplus, to repair the budget would, would be to reduce taxation, to have a flat tax with no deduc uh, uh, deductions. Um, and certainly cut on a, on, a, on a litany of wasteful government programs. And you're only going to get that with a coalition government because let's remember that uh, Bill Shorten has, as he, he put it, uh, will uh, restore the, the tax for, for millionaires. And so he wants to, and also another big part of his platform is, you know, inequality. So he wants to, you know, go after the, you know, rich people. Well, Tim, um, you, you, you obviously work for an Australian company. I don't want to say who you work for on air, but certainly the person who you work for is not in the lower income bracket. They are certainly uh, a wealthy person. And you have to, to face the, the reality here that millionaires are the employers. Uh, so taxing millionaires, you know, in ordinary amounts is only going to encourage them to uh, to not invest uh, into their workforce, into their companies, into their employees. Um, so I certainly do think that that is a, a completely uh, counterproductive um, way to go about things uh, is increased taxation. And uh, would you really trust Labor to be, you know, to be able to make these reductions that uh, the government has just announced, uh, for example, a uh, reduced expenditure on border control. I mean, let's not forget why we had high border control costs in the first place, because under the Rudd and Gillard government, they opened the floodgates again, where yep. uh, we were getting a, a boat a week. And, you know, that, that's why, you know, we had these high detention centre costs. And because, you know, finally the boats are stopped, that means that uh, the, uh, the expenditure is being reduced. Yeah, and, and obviously Labor neglects to mention that they, they obviously, I wouldn't say they've done a, a cost-benefit analysis of, of border protection because border protection is great because, say, for each asylum seeker that we accept, you know, it probably costs at least a million dollars um, to settle these people into the immunity, give them the training they require. Um, and, you know, per capita, unfortunately, I don't have the stats on me here, but, but certainly it is cheaper in the long run to actually, you know, protect our borders. Um, and in Labor, obviously, are oblivious to this fact. Yeah. Probably the, the biggest news to come out of the, the US this week is, ironically, to do with the or NFL or the uh, National Football League, which is the the highest professional American uh, fo football league uh, in, in the nation. Uh, now, uh, the NFL players have now uh, decided, many of them, to kneel before the national anthem is played before matches to protest the, the treatment of African Americans by the, the police and uh, legal system. Now, it started last year with uh, one, uh, one player, Colin Kaepernick uh, starting this uh, trend, and now it's happened again at the beginning of the the 2017 NFL season, uh, and it's really blown up now with uh, Trump uh, getting involved, where he said that NFL owners should fire uh, players who who kneel, and the the fans should work out, and that's just had a ripple effect. With now heaps of teams uh, are, do are doing it now, and even as there's been cases of the owners joining them. Some have even refused to, to come out with the uh, while the national anthem is being played, and it's just gotten really messy. I, I think it's all just, well, it's all just bullshit, really. Um, more black cops um, kill white people than, you know, white cops kill black people. Look at that. You know, they, they don't look at that. You know, the hands up, don't shoot, the whole Michael Brown, what was a falsehood, you know? Um, and, and a lot of these cases, you know, they, they will have a concealed weapon on them. You know, they won't be compliant with the police. Uh, they'll be in a ghetto. And, the, and you know, there's, you know, a breakdown in communication and something awful happens. Uh, there, there is hardly any police throughout America who just say, oh, I, I've got a, a Sambo, you know, I've got a Negro here, I'm boom, boom, I'm going to shoot them. You know, it's just completely rubbish. 
Um, it's just a, it's a far left politicization of sport. You know, it is disgusting. Um, I want to see politics completely out of sport. You know, I, I don't want to see a yes banner on the AFL. You know, I don't want to see, you know, any, you know, I don't want to see any, you know, LGBTI thing to do with sport. I don't want to see, oh, let's get women in higher positions or whatever. Just have sport as sport. Obviously, if people are good, they'll rise to places on their merits. If there's a woman who's good enough to do anything, she'll get there. There is no, you know, white evil society. There is no patriarchy holding people back. This is all just rubbish. And I think that it is completely disgusting to see owners and players disrespect um, the United States in such a way, disrespecting veterans, you know, disrespecting, you know, hardworking public servants, disrespecting, you know, just the whole society at large for not standing for the national anthem. And I'd hate to see such a disgusting and vile thing uh, spread to the AFL and the NRL, but certainly it wouldn't surprise me uh, after seeing the politicisation of sport here in Australia. And, uh, like, these NFL players, they're entitled to, you know, a political opinion. I mean, they do have free speech, but, you know, you're paid to, you know, be a football player. And I think making the political statement while you're at work, I mean, this is their, their workplace. Uh, uh, and not not just that, but also, you know, doing it during the, the national anthem. I mean, that is completely inappropriate, in, in my opinion. Like, you know, do... Uh, I, this was made by um, uh, one of our other contributors, uh, Steele, uh, that, that, you know, why, why not just do this, you know, in your, you know, spare time on social media? Why, you know, basically do it, you know, while, while you're on the field, while you're carrying out your work and, or, and you know, turning your workplace into a political arena. I think that's, uh, that, that's what's the real problem here. Well, let me just throw out a hypothetical here. Um, we see a lot of teachers uh, who are members of unions um, basically shove, you know, anti-Australian propaganda down the throats of children. Um, draw another Australian flag, 26th of January's Invasion Day. So we definitely do see a lot of people using their work time to influence and change uh, public opinion in a negative light. So I, I definitely do think that that's something that needs to be looked at. But I just hate to see the politicisation of sport. Obviously, I do respect the right to free speech, but I, I also really enjoy... You know, sitting down and watching a game of gridiron or a game of AFL or a game of union or league or cricket um, and not thinking about, you know, politics or the budget or, you know, racial inequality or, you know, the patriarchy or anything like that. I just want to sit down and watch a good game. And I think that a lot of people just want to sit down and watch a good game and unwind for the week. And uh, you're seeing, you know, that being taken away from people, which is terrible. Uh, you're seeing shows like Jimmy Kimmel being used uh, in America to push uh, universal health care. You're seeing John Oliver bang on about 100 things. People don't want to see their late night television comedy or their sport turning into politics. They just want to be, you know, left the hell alone and they just want to enjoy their evening you know, without having all this political garbage and hoo-ha shoved down their throats. And, of course, what makes it worse is that they're disrespecting the, the national anthem, which is supposed to be, you know, even though, like, America, like, nobody n denies it has its problem, but to basically say, you know, I, I refuse to uh, ba basically celebrate, you know, being an American, like, so, uh, you know, not rising for the national I think that you know, makes it even worse. Well, yeah, certainly, but I think that it is, in a sense, just uh, kind of a, a personification of, uh, you know, what's happening uh, in society in America is that you have one group, the affluent class, you know, in America who aren't uh, happy you know, with America, they aren't happy with what America stands for. They're of the Barack Obama, let's apologise for being American class. 
And then you have the middle class, the working class, um, who are proud to be American, who want to enjoy their football, who want to enjoy their baseball, their uh, NASCAR, whatever. And they don't really give two hoots about politics, but they're proud of their country and they love their country. Uh, and I think that that, that, is, that is one thing that needs to be taken into account. But you also, a lot of people say that the Civil War, and I know I'm going to dangerous territory here, was started because of slavery. And, and yes, that, that, that is a reason. But another reason why the Civil War started in America is because people in the North were telling people in the South, you know, what to do, how to live your life. And I definitely do think that uh, this will... Uh, you know, rupture society, will cause tension, uh, will cause society to come apart. Um, you know, if there's one group of people who really love their country, who really, you know, see America as a beacon of peace and liberty, and then there's one group of people who see, you know, America as this uh, patriarchal, evil white society run by monolithic big corporations, I think that that's one dangerous thing. I think that we certainly... You know, if, if people are united, one people under one flag, you know, it doesn't matter your race or religion. That's how America, you know, was set out by the founding fathers. And if, if that uh, goes to waste, then uh, you definitely will see the, the rise of, of, of fringe political movements on the left. And, of course, not surprisingly, there's been leftist commentators in Australia who've urged Indigenous uh, AFL and NRL players at this weekend's grand final to, you know, adopt this protest, uh, you know, uh, and because of the reason, you know, of Indigenous carceration rates. And uh, that, that would be... Uh, we don't we don't need that here, and I think that would really. I mean, we we saw the you know reaction of the the fans to you know when Adam Good started to you know carry on about you know uh, uh, Australia's you know uh, dark history and you know a genocidal thing. I mean, he he got booed. I think that uh, I mean we've already seen enough politicization of the AFL and NRL. I think this would you know really uh, you know drive a you know wedge in, in the sport more than anything else before. And with Adam Goods and with Colin um, Kaepernick, you're only seeing the thin edge thin edge of the wedge here and I think that it does certainly have the potential to become a lot worse. Um, I think we should just leave it on this note is that politics should stay away from sport uh, and politics uh, should largely stay away from entertainment uh, if it's you know completely one-sided let's bash right wingers um, because it alienates people. Um, all this politicisation in sport and entertainment, it only alienates and divides people and it serves no conducive kind of, um, you know, outcome. All it, all it seeks to do is divide people, you know, upon political ideas or race or religion or, you know, ethnic background. And I think that, you know, this is just uh, kind of, you know, you know, just it's just a prism of what's happening, and we we need to remember that we are one people united behind one flag and and one culture, and we shouldn't seek to divide people on the basis of of class, religion, and culture, and especially we shouldn't allow sport or entertainment to be a platform for such a thing. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Uh, that's all we've got time for this week. So thank you once again, Jacob, for joining me. Yeah, no worries, Tim. And just a reminder to everyone uh, to share um, The Unshackled with your friends uh, if they're as sick as we are of reading the, the, the rubbish in the mainstream media and they want to see a completely, um, you know, honest and frank opinion on the news, uh, to tell them to come over and, and read and watch material on The Unshackled. Uh, and, and I wish everyone to have a good week. Uh, enjoy your weekend and uh, certainly we'd love to see you back next week. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Our next major event is Liberty Fest in Brisbane on Saturday the 14th of October 2017, which we are a sponsor of. It's hosted by our good friends at Liberty Works. It is happening in only two weeks, so don't forget you can get a 20% discount on tickets by visiting libertyfest.org.au using the coupon code LFUNSHACK, all caps. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.